Hi guys, today's video is going to be about the books that I read in June minus the handful of romances that I've already talked about in my second to last video. If you've watched that video, you'll know that I've been going through kind of an Australian phase lately, which is still ongoing. And so I finally read Jane Harper's The Lost Man. This is a murder mystery that is set on a cattle station in Western Queensland. A cattle station is a cattle farm or ranch if you're American. If you've watched the romance video, you'll have heard me rave about these Australian cattle stations because the size of them is just mind-boggling. These properties are thousands of square kilometers big. Australia's biggest cattle station, Anna Creek Station, is 24,000 square kilometers big. That's bigger than El Salvador. And since they have to cover such huge distances when they are mustering and driving in the herd, a lot of stations use helicopters to drive in the stragglers, but the bulk of the work is still done on horseback and on dirt bikes, and it's a week-long activity. The station in this novel is 3,000 square kilometers big, which is modest by Australian standards, but it's still bigger than Hong Kong. Um, the station is in private hands. It is owned by two brothers who have inherited the, the station from their father. Their older brother has taken his share of the inheritance and has made it his own station. So he is now the family's next door neighbor, which still means that he is a couple of hours away from them by car. And the next small town is three hours away. So. As always, crazy distances there in the Australian outback. These stations buy groceries for six months at a time and have them delivered by truck to their own cool houses. I love the idea, to be honest, the idea of not having to worry about grocery shopping and what you're going to eat from one week to the next, but having it all sorted out for months at a time. But anyhow, so on a midsummer morning, our protagonist Nathan, who is the oldest brother, gets called to a spot far out on the family property where the middle brother has died from dehydration and exposure, while his fully stocked car sat on a dirt track a few kilometers away. The police don't treat the death as suspicious because he has no other wounds and it happens all the time that people walk off a couple hundred meters and suddenly become disoriented and get lost in the desert and that's that. And if it wasn't an accident, if he didn't get lost, then there's always the possibility of suicide because um, he has been acting troubled lately. But Nathan doesn't believe that. For one, his brother was too experienced and he would never have been so stupid as to leave his air-conditioned car, which was fully stocked with food and water and petrol, and just wander off for no apparent reason. And if it was suicide, then Nathan really wants to know what triggered that, because um, his brother wasn't exactly the self-flagellating kind, usually. So this is a novel all about small town dynamics, even though the town is so far off in this case, and about family dynamics and about the people that you meet in these places. The locals, but also those who are just passing through. And it is about the way these families out there work in both senses of the word. I absolutely loved this. I already loved the setting going into it, but whereas the atmosphere in that romance novel that I read with the same setting, whereas that atmosphere is one of adventure and comfortable seclusion, Jane Harper's atmosphere is all oppressive heat and stifling isolation. And I also loved the main character, Nathan, and how it was slowly revealed just how strong a character he is. 
The mystery was good too. I have to say, at about the 60% mark, I had a very good idea of who the murderer was. And it was all but confirmed at about the 70-75% mark. But it didn't detract from my enjoyment of it. And it wasn't as if the characters in the novel were all being thick by not realizing it. I think it's something that only the reader could have guessed. And it made the emotional impact of the story and how it ended all the more strong. So yeah, great novel, great mystery, absolutely loved it. One of the best books that I've read this year. My other Aussie reads have been not such great successes. I read Tim Winton for the first time, who is Australia's most decorated author, I think. I've, I'd never read him before, and I only remembered the other day that I've actually watched a film adaptation of his short story collection, The Turning. One of the most boring films I ever sat through, two hours long or more, and I couldn't even leave because it was this big special screening at the Berlin Film Festival and Hugo Weaving was in the audience and everything. But I don't even remember if I applauded in the end. It was just... <laughs> All of the stories were just so trite and conventional and downright formulaic. If I had remembered that earlier, I don't think I would have bothered with a novel. So I read Tim Winton's most recent novel, The Shepherd's Hut. It is narrated in the first person by a 15-year-old boy from Western Australia. His mother is dead, his father is violently abusive. And one evening the boy comes home and finds his father dead. He killed himself in a domestic accident. And because it is widely known in the neighborhood that his father had these abusive habits, the boy is scared that people will accuse him of having faked the accident and having in fact murdered his father. So he runs away. Actually, um, the way his character is introduced, um, this reaction of his is totally plausible in the novel. So he runs away with the intention of making his way through the salt flats and the desert or the semi-desert to another small town further north where he hopes to meet a person that he knows there. But he hasn't packed all that diligently as he was in such a hurry and so the journey gets quite rough for him. He survives surprisingly long though, and again, it's not a stretch of the imagination how he does it. Um, and he, his condition gets worse and worse every day, until he meets an Irish priest, of all things, who lives in a metal hut in the desert. He lives there quite comfortably, or in, in relative comfort, let's say. Um, compared to our narrator, and he takes the boy in um, with quite some reluctance on the part of the boy. The priest was exiled into the desert, although by whom we do not know, and we also don't know what exactly he did to deserve such a punishment. But he professes that he is not a pedophile. He is convinced that the boy was actually sent by God like an angel of revenge to carry out God's divine punishment on him. The boy, of course, thinks that this is a ludicrous idea. But is it really this far off? Question mark, question mark, question mark. This was ever so slightly over the top and I got the impression that this slim book was quite full of itself, even though in the end there isn't that much to it and there's very little takeaway. It's just this contrived spectacle but with very little meaning behind it. At least I didn't find much meaning in it. And then the voice of the first person narrator. I mean, I obviously have no experience when it comes to what an uneducated 15-year-old from Western Australia would sound like. 
but here it read ever so slightly of it it read like a 60 year old was faking teenage slang and that just never works out well i mean I couldn't believably fake teenage slang of present-day Germany and in my case the age gap is even significantly smaller. And the thing is, the harder you try to make it authentic, the less authentic it actually sounds and the more embarrassing it gets every single time. So yeah, all in all, I guess uh, this was my first and my last time reading Tim Winton. Sorry, Timbo. Same goes for Chris Hammer and Gary Disher. I read Scrublands by the former and Bitter Wash Road by the latter. They are both murder mysteries set in small towns in the Victorian bush. In a bitter Wash Road by Gary Disher, the copper of that small town investigates the death of a, a teenage girl who was hit by a car and left dead at the side of the road. And there's also talk about a serial killer duo on the loose. I didn't get very far into it before I gave up. I very quickly got very frustrated with how every single female that appeared in the story instantly got objectified, down to the 12-year-old witness who is going to be such a great beauty in just a few years' time. And these comments obviously weren't thrown in to characterize the protagonist as either a womanizer or an old pervert or in any way problematic but they were apparently just thrown in because that's just the way a dude bro crime writer writes and I don't have time for that. Scrublands by Chris Hemmer was just as bad in its own way um, but I read all of it but only because unfortunately I was buddy reading it. In Scrublands, a year before the story begins, the priest in this small town in the Victorian bush one day, seemingly out of the blue, opens fire on his congregation and kills five men before he is shot dead by the police. And now the protagonist, who is a journalist for the Sydney Morning Herald, is sent in to write a piece about how the town copes with the event a year on. So like a where are they now kind of story. However, the reporter, Martin, almost instantly finds himself investigating the murder instead, because the event was never satisfyingly explained. But it wasn't an issue for the police and the justice system because the murderer was dead, so the case was effectively solved. So now Martin finds himself playing investigative journalist to, to find answers because he's gotten curious. Problem is, or one of the problems of the book is, that he goes about his job like a total dilettante and he goes against just about every rule and every standard for correct journalist behavior. He doesn't double check his facts and his info before he reports it to the Morning Herald. He publicly outs a secret government agent and he reports prematurely and before his claims are corroborated by the police and thereby he publicly paints people as alleged murderers and rapists and pedophiles even though the police have never actually accused them of any of that. And it's not even painted as hugely problematic behavior in the book, just as normal human error, which it isn't because he isn't an intern. And Martin never suffers any real repercussions for it. On the contrary, with every blunder, people just seem more eager and willing to work with him and share their secrets with him. The the a local policeman confides secrets in him which he has never before told anybody. Uh, the government agent can't wait to team up with him and it's mostly because 
people in town trust him and confide in him. Um, which is kind of inexplicable in and of itself, except that uh, Martin has actually gotten some opportunities to prove himself the local hero and has made people trust him even though he has behaved like an insensitive asshole all of the two days that he has been there. But you see, on day two, uh, he actually saved the son of one of the widows of the shooting from certain death in a near fatal accident, a car accident, that he just happened to witness on the road. Lucky coincidence, huh? And then the next day there is a bushfire, yay! And Martin has once more the opportunity to prove himself a hero and worthy of the townspeople's trust. Uh, when he, uh, when his good buddy, the policeman, takes him with him in his car when he drives to a house just outside of town to rescue the inhabitant from his burning building. Again, totally sensible behavior on the part of the policeman and totally in accordance with the ethics of his job. Uh -huh. It's all just so ridiculous. And the most ridiculous thing of all is there is a woman. Of course, there is a woman. She's the first woman, in fact, the first person that Martin meets in town. And of course, he fancies her. She is incongruously running a used bookshop slash vintage cafe in a town in which most people can't even really read. And even the local pub has had to close. Anyway, Martin and Mandy, M&M, &M, get to talk twice and then suddenly at the beginning of chapter 12 or so, Martin wakes up in Mandy's bed without there having been the slightest preparation of their getting together. Except that, of course, he is the guy from the big town, big important journalist, and Mandy has a strong sex drive, as is witnessed by her having gotten pregnant accidentally already twice. So I guess it was just bound to be, right? Completely and utterly ridiculous. But at least the author seems to have been aware that his protagonist is a complete dud. So he tried desperately to make him sympathetic by giving him PTSD, which has no major impact on the plot, but never mind. Of course, he could have gotten PTSD in any kind of old gruesome accident somewhere in Australia, but no, he had to get it from an experience that he had while reporting in the Gaza Strip. Because talk about conflict in the Middle East is always such a crowd pleaser and apparently nothing's too cheap for this novel. But apparently even Chris Hammer was aware that it wouldn't do to have evil demon Arabs with rifles running across his pages. So he has his protagonist hide in the boot of his car for a day and a night and be afraid of evil Arabs with rifles. And that's how he got his PTSD, poor darling. And because the more mentions of war in the Middle East, the better, he throws in some soldiers in Afghanistan in another corner of the story for good measure. And to top it all off, because the audience loves this kind of shit, we have some Westerners running an orphanage in Indonesia. Isn't that beautiful? It was all just so offensively cheap. And don't even get me started on the ending and the solution. If I hadn't been buddy reading it, I would never have finished it. And But this way I had to, but it made me want to shower with bleach. And the last book that I'd like to talk about today is The Arsonist by Chloe Hooper, which is a little bit different because it's a non-fiction book. And usually I would wrap this up together with other non-fiction books in a non-fiction wrapper. But it just fits in so well here because it's an Australian true crime story. 
This is a story about and in the wake of Black Saturday, which is February 11th, 2009, a day on which 400 separate fires were burning in the Victorian bush. 173 fires were caused directly by these fires and that's not counting for example death from heart attacks which occurred a little while later or even on the day but couldn't legally be connected directly with the fires. Some of the fires, including the most deadly ones, were caused by faulty power lines because the power companies don't monitor their infrastructure well enough. But some fires were also deliberately lit, including the one that burned through the town of Churchill. Now, apparently, arson is very nearly the perfect crime because apparently only about 1% of arson cases are ever solved, meaning that only in 1% of all cases of suspected arson, an arsonist is apprehended. In the case of the Churchill fire, the police were led almost instantly to a suspect, the town loner who had a history of lighting fires in his garden and of terrorizing his co-workers and his neighbors and generally being a creep. Um, during uh, the subsequent trial, it came to light uh, that he was somewhere on the autism spectrum, although it's never clearly stated how severe his condition is and uh, that he had some kind of impairment in his intellectual development. Although his legal defense team tried to milk this diagnosis for all it was worth, obviously, um, he was ultimately convicted of lighting the fire deliberately and was sentenced to a relatively mild prison sentence. Apparently he fared well in prison and became uh, the head gardener of the prison greenhouse. So I found the first third of the book extremely interesting. This third is all about Black Saturday in general and the Churchill fire in particular and about how people survived the fire or how people died in the fire. And it is about how the fire specialists and the arson squad of the police reconstructed the development of the fire and how they kind of reverse engineered it to find the spot of ignition or spots in this case. So that was super fascinating. The second and third part where it was all about the guy and his history were super frustrating. For me, the vital question got practically ignored. The question of whether or not the guy could be held responsible for his actions which was contested and um, the judges of both the inquest and the trial and the jury were with the police in the end and against the legal defense team. The thing is, just because you're somewhere on the autism spectrum doesn't mean that you can't be expected to control an impulse to cause a natural catastrophe. And the inability to read facial expressions and social clues doesn't necessarily imply the inability to abide by the law and, and not kill people. And whether or not you can feel empathy doesn't directly impact the ability to abide by the law either. So I think the question here should have been just exactly how conscious this person was of his actions and um, just how much impulse control he had and not how severely he was bullied in school. So this would have been worth discussing and investigating and I would have expected the author to interview some specialists here like psychologists, criminal psychologists, social workers or even sociologists. But instead we just get the lawyers pointing out the defendant's lonely childhood. So in the absence of any meaningful discussion, the aim is just to make the reader feel sympathy towards the underdog and to see his side of things. 
But since we never actually get a qualified statement about what his side of things actually is, at the end of the day, this isn't worth very much. So the way it was done, unfortunately, it just seemed like such a waste of time and pages for Chloe Hooper to concentrate on the arsonist when she could have written about the Black Saturday fires in general. I still enjoyed her writing and, like I said, the first third was fascinating. And I think I'm going to read Chloe Hooper's other non-fiction book, um, The Tall Man, someday soon. This is about an indigenous Australian man who was killed in police custody and it is about this man's life and his nation in general too. So yeah, that was a slightly rocky beginning to my journey into Australian literature, but Jane Harper's The Lost Man was worth all that other crap. I'm curious if you've read any of the books. In particular, I'm curious if you've read any of Tim Winton's books and what you thought about them. I'll see you again soon with my Midsummer Book Haul. Bye guys!